Welcome to episode 27 of Norse Myths, Legends, and Folk Tales. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we learn how the challenge between Thor and Ragnar goes in part two of Thor's duel with Ragnar. At Griotan Ungarder, there was a river with a bed of clay. Let us dredge it, said the giants. Let us mold a man so vast that Thor will shake it at the sight of him. Then the giants worked night and day and piled up the clay and made a mountain of a man. He was nine leagues high, and he measured three leagues across the chest from armpit to armpit. He may be so tall that the clouds gather around his head, said the giants, but he is nothing but clay. What are we going to do about his heart? The giants were quite unable to find a heart, anything like large enough. In the end, they killed a mare and put her heart in his body. Its pump was enough to give the clay life, but rather too unsteady to inspire much confidence. They called this clay giant Mistcalf and told him to wait by Griotan and Garter. On the appointed day, Hrachnir headed for the stone fence house, and unlike Mistcalf, his heart gave others heart. It was made of unyielding stone, sharp-edged and three-cornered. Hrachnir's head was made of stone, too, and so was the great shield he held in front of him as he waited for Thor. With his other hand, he grasped a huge hone. He shouldered it and was ready to hurl it. Ragnar looked very nasty and very dangerous. Then Thor, the son of Earth, angrily sprang into his chariot, and Theophi leaped in beside him. It rocked beneath them. The charioteer bawled at once. His two goats strained at their harnesses. The chariot rattled out of Thungrom. The chariot rattled out of Thrudvong. The moon's path quivered and echoed. Lightning flared and flashed, and men on Middle Earth thought the world itself was about to catch fire. Then hail lashed the ground. It smashed frail stalks and flattened fields of grass, and men quailed within their walls. Headlands were shaken by such storms that gullies and rifts and gashes and chasms opened underfoot, and rocks and boulders cascaded into the curdling sea. They rolled into Jotaheim towards Griotan and Garder. Then the Alfi jumped out of the chariot and ran ahead of it until he could see Hrognir and Mistcalf. They stood side by side, and Mistcalf's heart jumped inside him. Thor, can you see you? shouted the Alfi. Can you hear me? Thor, can you, with your shield raised before you? The Alfi cupped his hands to his mouth. Can you hear me, Hrognir? Put it on the ground. Stand on your shield. Thor will come to you from below. Then Hrognir laid his stone shield on the ground and stood on it. He grasped his hone with both hands. The moment he saw Hrognir standing at the stone fence house, Thor brandished his hammer and hurled it at him. The giant was assaulted by blinding forked flashes and claps of thunder. Hrachnir saw the hammer flying towards him. He drew back his hone and aimed it straight at Mjolnir. The hammer and the hone met in midair with a dazzling followed by a crack that was heard through the nine worlds. The hone was smashed into hundreds of fragments. The shrapnel flew in every direction. One piece flew to Midgard and splintered again as it crashed into the ground. And every bit is a whetstone quarry. Another piece whistled through the air and lodged in Thor's head. The strongest of all the gods was badly wounded. He fell out of his chariot and blood streamed over the earth. But Thor's hammer found its target. Despite the hone, Mjolnir still struck Hrognir on his forehead and crushed his skull. The giant tottered and fell, 
and one of his massive legs pinned Thor down by the neck. When Miss Calf saw Thor, he was terrified. He sprang a leak and peed uncontrollably. Then Thialfi swung his axe and attacked Miss Calf, the giant with feet of clay. Thialfi hacked at his legs, and Miss Calf did not have enough strength in his body to fight back. He lurched and toppled backwards, and his fall shook Jotaheim. Every giant heard him fall. They knew what had happened at the Stonefist's house. My head! growled Thor. Thialfi inspected the piece of whetstone stuck in Thor's head. It is in better shape than Rocknir's head, said Thialfi. He seized the giant's leg and tried to lift it and release Thor. But for Thialfi, it was like trying to lift the trunk of a tree. He was unable to move it an inch. Get help, said Thor. Thialfi put his fleetness of foot to good use. It was not at all long before many of the gods hurried out of Asgard and came to Griotunagar, rejoicing at Thor's great victory and anxious to release him. One by one, the strongest of the gods tried to lift the giant's leg, but none of them, not even Odin himself, was able to do anything about it. The last to reach Stonefin's house was the son of Thor and the giantess Jarnsaxa. He was three years old, and when he saw how the gods were unable to release his father, he said, Now let me try. Magni stooped, grasped Rachnir by the heel, and swung the giant's foot away from his father's neck. All the gods cried out in wonder, and Thor quickly got to his feet. It's a pity I didn't come sooner, said Magni. If I had met this giant, I'd have struck him dead with my bare fists. If you go on as you've begun, said Thor warmly, clamping an iron-gloved hand on his son's shoulder, you'll become quite strong. My mother is Iron Cutlass, Magni said, and I am the son of thunder. What's more, said Thor, I'm going to give you gold mane. Take Ragnir's horse as a reward. Oh, said Odin sharply, you shouldn't give such an uncommonly fine horse to the son of a giantess instead of your own father. Thor took no notice. He clapped his hands to his banging head and rode back to Asgard, followed by the Aesir. Only Odin complained, and the other gods gave thanks that good had prevailed over evil, and that they seemed quite safe again, as safe as they had ever been. When Thor got back to Thredbong and walked into his own hall, Valskirnir, the whetstone was still stuck in his head. So he sent to Midgard for Sibyl Groa, the wife of Arvandi the Brave. The wise woman hurried up over Bifrost, and all night she chanted magic words over Thor, charms and spells known only to her. As she sang, the hone began to work loose, and the hammering in Thor's head began to fade. It seemed less like pain than the memory of pain. Thor was so thankful that he wanted to make Groa happy. I have a surprise for you, he said. Nothing could surprise me, said Groa. This will, said Thor. Not long ago I was in the north, and I met your husband, Arvandi the Brave. Groa stiffened. Then she began to shake her head sadly. You may think he's dead, said Thor, but I brought him out of Jotaheim. I waded across the streams of Venner, El Vulgar, carrying him in a basket strapped on my back. Death, said Groa gruffly, not because she didn't want to disbelieve Thor, but because she did not dare to believe him. Do you need proof? asked Thor. Yes, said Groa. All night you've sung charms over my head, said Thor, and it is almost morning. Come with me. The Thunder God led the way out of Balskirnir into the silent courtyard. Look, said Thor, pointing into the sky. Have you ever seen that star? And Groa frowned and shook her head. Thor smiled faintly. 
one of R. Von D.'s toes stuck out of the basket and froze. So I broke it off and hurled it into the heaven. Now and always, that star will be known as R. Von D.'s toe. Groa's heart was pounding. Her eyes shone with tears of joy. Now are you satisfied, said Thor. And I'll tell you one thing more. It won't be long at all now before your husband gets home. Groa felt as if nothing else in the world ever mattered, and she felt as if there was no way in which she could properly thank Thor. Only finish your charms and spells, said Thor. Then I too will be happy. Groa looked at Thor and gaped. The charms, said Thor. The sibyl's head and heart whirled, and her blood raced round her body. She was so excited that she could not remember a single charm. Think, woman, said Thor fretfully. Groa buried her face in her hands, but it was no good. Think, woman, think, roared Thor. His eyes blazed, and his red beard bristled. But Groa was unable to think only of her husband, Arvon D's homecoming, and of a shining star. Thor sent her packing with a bellow of fury. And that is why the whetstone remained in Thor's head. And here is where I end my tale for today. Then I'll be back with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.